Rock of Ages. This is Pastor Matt, and welcome to Theology Thursday. Uh, today we are looking at a passage in Acts chapter 11, and it's the first organized missionary ascending event in the church's history. And the reason why we're looking at that today, uh, we're taking a little break from uh, the Parables of Jesus uh, series that we're in, uh, is because Paul and Alexa Fraser are uh, heading to Japan. If you haven't seen the Mission Monday video, which is posted this, earlier this week, uh, check that out and you can kind of see what that's all about. But we're going to miss Paul and Alexa, and on Sunday we're going to send them out uh, because they're taking off on Monday. Uh, but this passage deals with a question uh, that I want to answer for you. I think you've probably considered this at one point in your life or another. And I think it, it just does a really good job of answering it for us. And the question is, how do I know if God is calling me to do something? How do I know if God is calling me to do this or that or that, 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 that? Okay, that's what we're going to answer uh, to a certain extent here. But we're going to do it by first looking at this passage. The passage begins in verse 19. Uh, with the writer saying, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. If you remember from earlier in the book of Acts, Stephen was the first martyr of the church. And one of the key players in that whole scene was Saul, later known as Paul after he gets converted. But prior to his conversion, Saul went and just began to ravage the church and he drove them all out of these places and so the church scatters, they go all over the place. And some of them end up uh, in Antioch. So these believers are speaking the word of the gospel only to Jews. They aren't speaking the word of the gospel to any non-Jewish people. But there were some of them, these men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they came to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, these non-Jewish people, and they're preaching the Lord Jesus. And once you know it, but the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And if you go back to chapter 10 and earlier in 11, you see that this question of, can the Gentiles come into the faith? Can the Gentiles be legitimate believers? That's been a question the church has been wrestling with. And the answer has been, yeah, they can be believers. Yeah, they can be believers. They can come to faith. Look, it's happening. And now here in Antioch, it's happening. And the church decides, well, here, let's send Barnabas. Let's see if he can figure out how we can bless this work going forward. So they send Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and he saw the gift of God, the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted all of them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, he was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. And one of the things to kind of make note of here, Barnabas, uh, if you go back in Acts, after Saul gets converted, Saul goes to Jerusalem and he's trying to let the people know, he's like, hey, I'm not one of the baddies anymore. You can trust me. I'm not someone who's trying to kill you. And the church doesn't really trust him because of how vicious he was towards them. But Barnabas stands up for him and he says like, no, like God is working through Saul here. I see the Spirit's work here. And here in Antioch, Barnabas is seeing this work and he's saying, my goodness, I need help. I wonder if Saul would be able to come here. And so he goes down to Tarsus. If you remember, Tarsus was uh, Saul's hometown. And when he goes there, he finds them and he brought them up to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and they taught a great many people. And we have this wonderful line that in Antioch, the disciples, the learners of Jesus, were first called Christians. And it's this beautiful picture. Maybe it was a, a title of derision at some point. You know, people were making fun of them. But it's a beautiful picture of this church who 
has taken to heart Barnabas' instruction to resolve in the heart to be faithful to Christ, to be a little Christ of him, to follow him, to be known by him, to find their identity in him. Uh, this church apparently just grew so strong. Is a, like a, There's a revival that's broken out and it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Now, the passage continues. I'm kind of breaking it up here. The end of chapter 11, there's a bunch of stuff that takes place. There's a guy in chapter 12, a guy gets eaten by worms. It's bananas. Uh, but we're skipping, skipping over that. And instead, we're just kind of looking at the end of Paul and Barnabas's time in Antioch because it does come to an end. Chapter 13, verse 1 reads, now there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers. There was Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them on. And this thing that kind of really pops out at me here, and it's throughout the whole book of Acts, is just how involved the Spirit of God is in sending his church into new areas and to go and do new things. The Spirit is always doing this stuff, and it, and it seems like they're in like this worship service, there's fasting and prayer going on, and it's maybe the Holy Spirit speaks through one of these prophets that were there. Maybe it was a kind of a thing where they're all praying and they realize, oh, Paul and Barnabas, you guys gotta go. You gotta go. There's all these people around us, these neighboring towns, and way beyond these neighboring towns across this continent, there's all these people that need to know Jesus, and the only way for them to know it is if someone goes to them to bring that good news to them. I don't know exactly how it took place. Maybe it was miraculous in that way. Maybe it was just kind of the natural sort of intuitions that we get that the Spirit works in us. But regardless of how it happened, the Holy Spirit did speak in that church to say, Paul, Saul, Barnabas, you guys gotta go. And you can imagine that not being a happy thing for the church. I mean, they're happy that the gospel is getting to go somewhere else, but maybe they wanted to cling on to them a little bit. But the Spirit said, you gotta let them go. Set them apart, let them go. And so they did. They, they, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they let them go. Now that's the passage. We're gonna talk more about that on Sunday, kind of in a specific way for us as we process losing and letting go of Paul and Alexa. But I want to get back to that question. You know, how do you know when God is calling you to do something? Whether it's like to be a missionary or to be a pastor or to marry someone or, you know, start up a, a cat sweater knitting company. I don't know. Like, how do you know when God is calling you to do something? These cases, like what we have in this passage, is miraculous and prophetic word. They're rare, they do happen, um, but they're rare. The majority of the time, God speaks to us through ordinary means like our experiences or uh, the education that we've received, the acquaintances that we have, all these little things that we're able to kind of pool all together and say, well, that seems to make sense. In, in other words, most of the time when God calls us, he invites us to use wisdom uh, to weigh all these different things together. And uh, actually this passage does line up with it. It actually is a very wise thing to send out Saul, this uh, massively trained uh, teacher in Judaism who can link together the Old Testament with Jesus and show how he's the fulfillment of that. But I, I, wanted, I want you to think about this for you and how you respond to God's call in your life. I, I like to think of this uh, as, a, as, a, as a hand test, okay? Uh, and it's because there's five points to it and it's easy to remember. And the first thing, the first thing that I want you to weigh as you consider what God might be calling you to do is to just ask, does it line up with what God says in his word? If you feel like God is saying to you that you need to go punch a dog, like probably don't. Like that's not, that doesn't line up with what God would have you go do. You know, God isn't calling you to go do something dumb, okay? So that's kind of 
them the first thing. Like, is it immoral or is it rejecting previous commitments that you've made that you still have to hold on to? You just ask that. Does it line up with God's word and what he has taught us? If it doesn't, you don't even need to keep on going. But if it does, then you keep going. And the second thing, it's like what the church did in Acts 13, prayer. Now, Christians are never commanded to fast in the New Testament. It's, it's done. It only comes up two times in Acts and then the rest of the New Testament. But uh, prayer is commanded. It is, uh, we are encouraged to pray and to seek the Lord's guidance on that and to just really slow down and think about what God is laying before our eyes. And so um, that's kind of the second thing. Is it in line with God's word or at least doesn't oppose God's word? Okay, then pray about it. And you spend time and there's no specific amount of time, but give some time to think about it and to bring those thoughts to God. Third thing is, and this is often a result of the prayer, is, I don't know how to really word this, but you know, does your heart burn about it? Like, is there, is there a problem out there that you wish someone would do something about? Like, does it kind of bug you that this thing doesn't have a solution yet? And if it does, if you're finally past number three, then you ask number four, and this is really hard for me to do here. Boy, there we go. Ask yourself, you know, do, do, you, do you feel confident that you have the abilities, the knowledge, the, the resources available to help you do that thing? Or would you be able to acquire them? I guess essentially you're asking, is it realistic for you? And knowing, of course, that God works through our weaknesses. So you ask those four questions. And then the last one, the fifth one, is what does the church say? Does the church affirm what you're sensing? Uh, does the church say, you know what, actually, yeah, we could see you doing that. And boy, we, we hope that you would do that. You go through those five things. Does it line up with what God says? You pray about it. Does your heart burn about it? Is it realistic? Does the church recognize that it's realistic? And do they, as they see you, do they also say, yeah, this is this is for you? You go through that. I'm not saying that God absolutely is calling you to do that, but it's it's a pretty likely uh, situation. Um, maybe a, a sixth a sixth question that you could uh, put on there, and it's, I guess it's not really so much of a question; it's more of a step, is to kind of put yourself in the position of doing it or not doing it. And then you ask, is that bring my heart peace or does that bring my heart distress? And and that's not to say that, you know, you will feel a ton of joy if you say, and like, like only unbridled joy if you say yes to all those five and then you put yourself in this position, you know. It doesn't mean that there isn't difficulty. Like I, I know Paul and Alexa, as they go to Japan, there's a lot of pain of leaving here, of leaving America. Like they're losing their country and their children are no longer going to be Americans in that normal way. Um, it won't be their homeland if they stay there long. And Japan is also not gonna really be their homeland completely because they'll be looked at as outsiders. Like there's pain there. But there's a lot of joy as well, and they and they sense like this is right. And, and so you kind of ask yourself, is this the right thing? Can I see myself doing this? And if you can, go for it. And you can know that, you know, if you mess up or if you make the wrong decisions, God's still God and he's going to make something beautiful out of the mess that we create. But, but I think if you use wisdom and use those five steps in that optional sixth step, I think you're going to be in a lot better spot. That's, that's kind of the method that uh, me and Julia used when we moved out here to Seattle. And it's the method that we'll use uh, the rest of our lives because it's wisdom. It's, it's taking all the resources that God has given to us and looking at them and weighing them and saying, okay, God, would you speak through them? And I think that works pretty good. I hope that's helpful for you. Next week, we will be back to uh, looking at a parable of Jesus and we'll have another question for you. Uh, but until then, this was Theology Thursday. Glad to have you and God bless you.